Welcome everybody. Thank you for being here today, either in person or over Zoom. Um, as, um, as Melanie mentioned, uh, my name is Margaret Hiddle. I'm the Director of Indigenous Studies at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, which is a relatively brand new certificate program that is the result of years of work of advocacy on the part of faculty, students, staff, and community members. And I'm really honored to have the opportunity um, to, to um, direct this new and growing program, um, which, you know, on the one hand is available for students um, to take classes in Indigenous Studies and enhance, um, enhance their majors and minors with a certificate in Indigenous Studies, and also helps to bring um, events like this to um, the um, to the campus and surrounding communities. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to gather here today on the past, present, and future homelands of the Menominee and Ho-Chunk nations, not to mention the Oneida Nation, who are also our neighbors. Um, I myself am Ojibwe, am Ojibwe, and according to my people's protocols, it's always polite to acknowledge whose lands we are on. It's also a good reminder to pause and reflect on the legacies of more than 200 years of displacement, violence, settlement, and survival that bring us all together here today. And hopefully that reflection leads to meaningful action in partnership with our native, with our native neighbors. Um, just by coming here or showing up online today, you all have taken at least some action. Um, and I thank you again for showing up. I would also like to thank the Appleton uh, Library and Melanie in particular for putting together this evening and the folks on the Fox Cities campus, especially Amanda and Alicia for coordinating. Also a quick thank you to the Intertribal Student Council at UWO who helped to advertise the event on campus. Um, so we're here today on the last day of Native American Heritage Month which is an opportunity to celebrate and for many of us learn more about Indigenous people's knowledge, experiences, and excellence here in Wisconsin and beyond the boundaries of our state. This is, of course, something that should ideally be a part of our everyday practice far beyond the, the month of November. But November gives us a chance to remind people that we are still here and we are thriving, and we are also fighting for justice and sovereignty for our people, which is why um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome tonight our, um, our first speaker, Heather Bruegel. Um, Heather is a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and a descendant of Stockbridge Muncie. She's a public historian, activist, and decolonial educator whose research covers topics related to American history, colonialism's legacies, boarding schools, and missing and murdered indigenous women, among many other topics. Basically, she's out here doing the hard work of correcting public narratives that misrepresent or erase indigenous people and advocating for justice in all its forms. And with that, I will turn it over to Heather. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for allowing me to be part of the event this evening. Just a couple of disclosures. I am actually recovering from COVID. So if my voice is a little quiet, I am sorry. I will speak as loud as I can. Um, and this is the first presentation I've done. Uh, I'm going to reschedule a lot of them just because of COVID. And um, I'm also in my bedroom isolating, which is why the the background is blurred because you don't need to see any of that. So um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to speaking to you tonight about this topic, which is super timely. And so I'm gonna cover a lot of information in a short amount of time, um, but we'll definitely have time for uh, Q&A um, uh, at the end of it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen with you right now. Um, here we go. Okay, so great. You should hopefully be able to, to see my screen and um, 
uh, be able to see what we're going to be talking about tonight. I first want to say thank you to um, the library and the university for hosting this event, um, for reaching out to me and, and wanting to talk about this very important and timely topic. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about ICWA, which is the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and I refer to it as ICWA just through the whole way through because it's just easier. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about. And this talk is titled, No More Stolen Children. And the reason it's titled that is because there was a time in this country, uh, and one could argue that it still happens now, that indigenous children were being stolen from their families, from their um, communities, from schools. And so this is something that we need to talk about. So we're gonna talk about um, why ICWA was needed, like what led up to ICWA being needed, and then what's happening now with it. So we're gonna cover a lot of information and um, we're gonna cover you know, the idea of boarding schools and um, some other tough topics. So if you have to step away, um, just for mental health issues, please do so. Um, you know, you your your mental health is more important than anything. So if you do have to to step away, please do so. Um, if you can come back, that's great. And if not, that's okay. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to um to watch it later if you're able to. But just note that. So oh, let me get my slides. Here we go. Okay, so I want to acknowledge the land in which I'm coming from. Um, I am coming from New York, New York State. I'm in New York State. I'm a Midwesterner, though, uh, through and through, but I'm currently living in upstate New York, and so I want to honor the Haudenosaunee, the Maikaniak, and the Lenape people. We acknowledge that through forced land sessions and removal, these nations were removed from the land that they called home, and their seats of government are now located in Canada, Wisconsin, other parts of New York, and Oklahoma. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, we understand that this acknowledgement is just a first step in the process of building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So I just wanted to start with that land acknowledgement. Um, I do live in upstate New York. I'm very honored and privileged to be able to live uh, in the homelands of my ancestors. So that's really cool. Um, it is beautiful here, even though it is quite cold, but we don't have snow, so I'm not going to complain too much right now. I was already introduced, but just as a follow-up, I am an enrolled citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and a first-line descendant Stockbridge Muncie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I work as a historian, independent consultant. Um, I actually just started working, well, not just, but recently started working um, as a policy specialist for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, um, where we cover tough topics as well. Um, so that's one of the things that I do as well. My contact information is on the screen here. Uh, do feel free to reach out um, whenever you need to, or if you have questions, maybe you think of something later, you can get me at that Gmail address. You can also follow me on Instagram and my website is up there. As of right now, I still have a Twitter. I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to keep it, but um, you can also reach out to me on Twitter. So that's just contact information if you want to get a hold of me for anything and um it's you know feel free to reach out at any point in time so um i want to i want us to just meditate on this slide for just a moment and meditate on this this quote the only good indian is a dead indian so let's just think about that for just a moment the photos on here <clears throat> are photos um, from the Wounded Knee Massacre, which happened in December of 1890. We're actually going to be coming up on an anniversary of that, as today is the last day of, of November. Tomorrow starts December. And um, I'm not going to go into what happened at Wounded Knee. You can look it up. You can uh, use the little handheld computers that we all carry with us. Um, but there was a massacre that happened in 1890 at Wounded Knee. And these are photos from that massacre. The idea of the only good Indian is a dead Indian was one way that the federal government felt like they could handle um, the quote Indian problem, right? So imagine being hated so much that your mere existence was a problem. They had to figure out what to do with you. And there are a few groups in the United States that have had to deal with that, um, not just indigenous peoples, 
but there are a couple other groups that have had to deal with that as well. But let's just think on this. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. Our mere existence wasn't good. The fact that we took up space wasn't good. So I want you to think on this as we continue to go through this presentation and think about this phrase, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. So there was um, this idea of cultural assimilation in the United States. This was something that was from the beginning, right? You know, when, you, uh, when the pilgrims came, uh, whenever settlers, colonists would come to settle in this quote, new world, what were we going to do with the people that were already here? What were we gonna do with those indigenous nations? So throughout various policies that the United States had, assimilation was something that they put in every policy. There was assimilation written into treaties. And assimilation was basically just a way to have a group of people, in this instance, us indigenous people, give up our traditional and cultural ways and assimilate into a more Eurocentric role, a part of a more Eurocentric society. So traditional gender roles, um, clothing, language, all of that. You, that was the policy of the United States. One of the ways, there were many ways that they um, instituted cultural assimilation. Um, policy was one of them. Another was boarding schools. And so boarding schools was just one of the many ideas on how to culturally assimilate a group of people. And so I want to spend just a moment to talk about boarding schools because all of this leads up to ICWA and why it's important to save it. I am a historian by training. So everything I do is based in, his, in, in history. You have to know how something um, came to be in order to know why we needed it. So we're gonna start with the boarding schools. So in the mid um, 1800s to early 1900s, the boarding school era was in full swing. Boarding schools were set up to take native children from their homes and families and charter them off to schools that were far away from anything that they knew. So um, many schools were out east and many of the students that were in these schools in the east were from tribes that were in the west. You had to separate them from what they knew and put them in an area that they didn't know. The schools were government and religious funded. Children were forcibly taken from their homes and when they arrived, their hair was cut, their clothing and belongings were taken, their names were changed and their language was stripped from them. Oftentimes there was physical, mental and sexual abuse that also happened at these schools as well. When a child had completed their schooling, more often than not, they found that they didn't belong anywhere. You didn't belong, uh, you didn't feel like you belonged in your community because you had to leave and attend these schools and you couldn't speak the language anymore and you didn't dress the same way that everybody else did. But also at the end of the day, you were still an Indian. So you didn't belong in white society either. So where were you to go? your sense of self was gone, your sense of belonging was gone. Um, and so you didn't fit in anywhere. So how did boarding schools start? <clears throat> On March 3rd, 1819, the Civilization Fund Act um, was something that was passed, was an act that was passed and it encouraged benevolent societies such as Christian missions and the federal government to provide education for Native Americans and were given money annually to help run these schools and help to stimulate, quote, the civilization process. This act also led, um, it led to the formation of the boarding school system. Federal funds were allocated to form schools that would teach indigenous children the white ways, and it would include forgetting their, their own traditional cultures and their own religions. And what it also did is it started a class system within native communities. So elders rightly opposed the formation of boarding schools and sending children there. 
but those who were considered more progressive took to the new system quickly, learned English, and gained leadership positions within the tribes that would also ultimately lead to treaties that would end up ceding land to the United States. So even though the thinking behind it might have been, well, if we can understand the language and have a more Western education, maybe we can prevent some of these things from happening, but it didn't. All it did was speed up that process. In 1920 or in 1824, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was created and placed in the War Department. And the main purpose was to distribute these funds for these schools. <clears throat> The policy that the U.S. had up to that point was that any good Indian was a dead Indian, but that was now becoming costly. It was um, uh, Hiram Price, who was the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in 1885, who said, it's cheaper to give them an education than to fight them. To change an entire people, you begin with the children. And the boarding school system was to do just that. Many families sent their children to boarding schools so that they would be taken care of and they would have food. Many times this was forced on parents, that they had to send their children to these schools or the family's rations would be withheld. And this was a common practice that the U.S. would, pra um, would put into play anytime something needed to be decided, like a treaty or anything like that. You withhold rations that are... Um, supposed to be provided to you by the federal government and you almost starve the correct decision um out and so one of the ways so we didn't have there wasn't a law on the books that said that you had to send your children to boarding schools we didn't have that here in Canada they did um but in the United States we didn't however it was almost impossible to not send your child to school because if you still had little ones at home and your rations are being withheld because you're not sending your older children to boarding schools, then your younger children are starving. So parents were forced to make these horrible, awful decisions to send their children to boarding schools so that the rest of the family would be able to eat. And this was a very common practice that the federal government would do. Schools were run on the backs of children. Farming, cooking, laundry, and repairs were always done by the students there. Only part of the day was actually used for your traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic. We don't have exact numbers just yet, but it's estimated by 1900, there were about 20,000 children in boarding schools. By 1925, that number would have tripled. There were 367 schools operating in 29 states. So boarding schools were awful and they were the start of children um, being forcibly taken from their homes. I happen to be the granddaughter and great granddaughter of boarding school survivors. And so that trauma definitely still runs deep and still is part of our contemporary history today. But as the boarding schools start to wind down, as that era starts to come down, um, and most schools were officially closed by the 1990s, which that's not that long ago. I know it's 2022, but when you think about it, we're not that far removed from that era, from that boarding school era, which means we're also not that far removed from the Indian Adoption Project. So... As boarding schools were winding down, there were, they, they the federal government, um, adoption agencies, social workers, what have you, were trying to find new ways of separating children from their families. So in 1958, the Indian Adoption Project was launched and it ran until 1967. They were aided by the prestigious Child Welfare League of North America, which was the predecessor to the Adoption Resource Exchange of North America. And they functioned from 1966 until the early 1970s. Many religious organizations were involved as well. The Mormon Church and the Catholic Church played big roles in this. The Mormon Church took thousands of Navajo children and adopted them out to Mormon homes or to work on Mormon farms. The Catholic Church, who also ran many of the boarding schools, would take children that were in their schools and foster and adopt them out 
to non-Native families and not tell their families, their biological families. So when the biological family would wonder where their child was, the Catholic Church would just make up some excuse. Oh, they're not here. Oh, they ran away. Um, oh, they don't want to come home to you anymore. They would just make up these excuses. Um, and that's really, really bad. That's really awful. So these families were left wondering where their children were. The Indian Adoption Project was also something that was funded through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Again, the purpose of this government-funded program was assimilation. <clears throat> that is the goal with any policy that the U.S. federal government had towards Native nations. Assimilation was a way to get rid of the, quote, Indian problem. Most of this time, most of the time, this removal was unneeded and caused more harm than good. From research and interviews that I was able to find when working on this topic, two children were taken from their home after being in the hospital, one with a rash and one who suffered from tuberculosis. Another adoptee recalled that they were taken away after their father died and their mother didn't want to give them up. Still, another person recalled that they were taken away because their grandfather was a medicine man and refused to give up the traditional ways. And in all these cases, there were no home studies that were done that would warrant taking these children from their families. There was no investigation being done. There was absolutely nothing done. Children were just taken without notice. So the Association on American Indian Affairs did a study. They caught wind of what was happening with Native children being taken. They conducted a national survey and found, at the time, 25 to 35 percent of Native children were being taken from their homes and extended families and being placed in child welfare and private adoption agencies. The hope behind the forced removal of children was that eventually tribes would just disappear. And why did we want tribes to just disappear? What was the goal behind that? As long as there's a tribal nation, as long as there is a federally recognized tribal nation where there is federal trust responsibilities and treaty obligations on the side of the federal government, those things still have to be honored. They have to be honored. <clears throat> Once the nation doesn't exist anymore, they don't have to be honored. So in essence, getting rid of the tribal nation works in favor of the federal government because then it's less, less federal trust responsibility that they have on their end. So the goal was always, the goal through boarding schools, the adoption program, all of that was to make sure that the tribes wouldn't exist. In essence, a very slow and painful genocide was happening on the side of federal government. This time it didn't involve guns and war. This time it involved taking children from their homes. The study also found that while fam that white families were using native children for farm labor. As stated earlier, many times children were taken without a reason, but there was always an underlying reason. While there were some reports of neglect, many federal agencies took this to mean that all Native parents were unfit to raise children, in turn, making it seem that all reservations were unfit environments for children to live on. And to be clear, sometimes children living with a relative or having an aunt or grandmother take care of them was also looked at as neglect. Now, we don't look at that as neglect. We look at that as um, traditional or cultural living. Um, but if you're not familiar with that, if you're not from that community, it can look like it's something, um, it just looks foreign, right? But Indigenous people aren't the only um, cultural group of people that practice multi-generational living, right? It happens throughout different cultures. But if you're not familiar with that, you look at that as, oh, that's there's too many people living in one house. This child is being neglected. When in reality, this child is surrounded by its aunties and grandmothers and uncles and love and community. It's actually a good thing. 
Going back to 1941, it was found that 85% of Native children had been taken from their homes. 85% of children had been taken from their homes. This was an intentional genocide that was happening, and Native children were just at the center of it. But I want to repeat that number again. Going back to 1941, as many as 85% percent of children were being taken from their homes 85 percent I can't I can't even fathom that right how that's just a number that is so big that I can't even think of it these children without any rhyme or reason were being taken from their homes and it gets worse I'm sorry to say it gets worse before it gets better <clears throat> so seeing what was happening native nations started to report that their children were missing and that something needed to be done. This crisis was affecting indigenous families and tribes. So in response to this, Congress enacted the Indian Child Welfare Act. ICWA was looked at as the best way to prevent, to protect the interests of native children and promote natives, I'm sorry, and promote the stability and security of native nations, basically saving the native nations. So in the course of passing ICWA, Congress identified four reasons why there were high rates of Native children being removed. The first was lack of culturally competent state child welfare standards for accessing fitness of Indian families, meaning that non-Native social workers didn't understand Indigenous culture and didn't make an attempt to. So. Um, that would mean like that multi-generational living. So walking in, seeing that, instead of asking questions and trying to understand it, that is part of culture, it's part of tradition, it was just, well, I'm not gonna learn about it. I'm just gonna say that this child is in some sort of danger. So that was one reason. The second, systematic due process violations against native children and their parents in custody hearings meaning parents, family members, and tribes were not being notified of court proceedings so often that they didn't know when to show up. So they weren't showing up to court hearings because they weren't being told when they were. So then it's looked at as, oh, you don't care. The third is economic incentives favoring the removal of children. The government, mainly the Bureau of Indian Affairs, was literally paying social workers to take children from their homes. So there was an economic incentive to take children from their homes. And the fourth reason that Congress identified was social conditions in Indian country. They were poor and underfunded communities. On the outside, reservations didn't look like good places to live, even though children were surrounded, surrounded, by community and family. So if you weren't familiar with the reservation system or how reservations ran, you just looked at them as poor communities, right? And we even know outside of Indian country, a number of children that are taken from their homes are usually from underfunded communities. And so that was just a label that was put on reservations. Oh, they're poor. The children must not be getting what they need. We have to take them out even though children on reservations were surrounded by community and family. <laughs> Excuse me. So in 1978, against actual opposition from church groups, several states, and social welfare groups, President Jimmy Carter signed the Indian Child Welfare Act. ICWA sets a minimum federal standard for nearly all Native children, uh, Native children custody proceedings. This includes adoption, voluntary and involuntary termination of parental rights, and removal and foster placement of children. ICWA also provides that states not have jurisdiction over adoption or custody hearings of children residing on reservations. And we'll get into that in a little bit, in a little bit more. ICWA was also there to help families and tribes address long lists of atrocity that had been committed over the years. 
When placing children now, caseworkers have to consider four things. Providing active efforts to the family, identifying placement that falls under the qualifications laid out in the act, notifying the child's tribe and parents of when custody hearings are, and working actively to provide the child's tribe and parents in court proceedings. All of these seem very normal. Like when I was reading and researching about these, I was like, oh, this all just seems common sense. But clearly it had to be put into a law um, because it wasn't being uh, utilized. And because of the protections that have been added, ICWA has been looked at as the highest standard in placing children into the system and then placing them into native homes. It also sets a unique relationship that tribal nations have within the United States. This is where it gets tricky. Native people are not classified by race, but rather as political entities because they are part of sovereign nations that are recognized by the United States. Native nations therefore should have a say in what happens to their children. And I'm gonna say this one more time. Native people, indigenous people, me, <clears throat> we are not classified by race. We are classified as political entities because we are part of citizens of sovereign nations that are recognized by the United States. This is key and this is to important to note because this is where the challenge to ICWA starts. So challenges to ICWA. In recent years, there have been threats to ICWA and its constitutionality. In fact, ICWA has been challenged more times than the Affordable Care Act, ACA, Obamacare. And we all know how often Obamacare, the ACA, has been challenged. I swear, I feel like we have a vote on this every couple of years, um, but ICWA has actually been challenged more than that. There is a case that just went before the Supreme Court on November 9th that challenges ICWA and its constitutionality. The state of Texas is asking that ICWA be thrown out. Those challenging it say the law is unconstitutionally race-based and gives too much power to tribes over the states. So let's just take that one for just a moment and break it down. Texas is saying that ICWA discriminates, is unconstitutional and discriminates on the basis of race, which we just talked about that indigenous people, native folks, are not race-based, we're political entities. And they're saying it gives tribes too much power over states because ICWA says that states do not have jurisdiction over adoption cases, adoption cases that involve native children living on the reservation. Now, to me, <laughs> That doesn't make sense because the U.S., the federal government, recognizes Native nations as sovereign nations. So how can we have too much power over the states when we're sovereign nations? So that is some food for thought. I want you to think about that because that one just absolutely blows my mind. <laughs> Louisiana and Indiana are other states and there are other states that have joined the challenge. Now, Louisiana and Indiana and the other states that have joined the challenge against ICWA also don't have very large indigenous populations. So what they're gaining from this, I don't know. The others in the case challenging ICWA are several non-native couples. The case is Brackeen v. Holland. In 2018, a federal court in Texas, in a decision that was widely criticized, said that ICWA violated the Constitution. Mm. It is argued that if ICWA is thrown out, this would decimate Native families, threaten tribal sovereignty, 
and Chair Park communities. The case involves Chad and Jennifer Breckin and a Navajo boy the couple wanted to adopt. The young boy was placed in their care when he was 10 months old to foster. They were told from the beginning that they would not be able to adopt him. When, the Navajo, when a Navajo couple was found to adopt the young boy, the Brackeens decided that they would fight it. The Brackeens won their case in the state and ended up adopting the young boy. They later filed a petition to adopt the young boy's sister who was born, um, who was born later and the Brackeens never even fostered her. In fact, the Brackeens had found out that she had been born, reached out to the birth mother and said that they wanted to adopt her. There are two other couples involved in this case as well. One um, who was not able to adopt the native child that they wanted to, and another one who I believe was able to adopt. The Brackeens lawyer argued that the preference that ICWA gives to native parents discriminates against non-native parents on the basis of race. What that basically means is under ICWA, non-native people don't get first pick. You're not, um, you're not at the top of the list. With any, any social worker will tell you that the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that that child is placed back with its family. That's, that's the whole, that's the goal, that's the hope, right? To place the child back with their family. It was the same thing. They want the child placed back with their family. If not, then family members, grandmas, aunties, whomever, extended family. If not then, then another native couple within the tribe, their community. If not then, then another native couple in general. And then after all of those are exhausted, then non-Native people may get the opportunity to adopt. So the Brackeens are saying that they were discriminated against on the basis of race because they couldn't adopt this Native child, even though ICWA, ICWA doesn't discriminate on the basis of race. ICWA is something put in place to protect children of sovereign nations. And saying that it discriminates against non-Native parents on the basis of race contradicts the central underlying premise of all federal Indian law, that tribal affiliation is political, not racial. This brings in the difficult and complex relationship between Native nations and the federal government. This is based on the idea, again, that tribal affiliation is political. The decision to throw ICWA out was immediately challenged, and on April 6, 2021, the justices of the Fifth Circuit issued a decision that wasn't actually a decision. <clears throat> they stated that portions of ICWA did commandeer state adoption proceedings, which they saw as a violation of the Tenth Amendment, but they also went on to say that the court was also evenly split on a range of issues regarding ICWA. Depending on how the Supreme Court rules, this could challenge Indian law all together. And again, oral arguments have already happened. They happened on November 9th. Um, I listened to part of them because uh, I was working and so I had them playing on in the background, but you should also be able to download the transcript. Um, and I have to say that having justices on the bench that don't have an understanding of federal Indian law um, is quite difficult. So what exactly is at stake? The worst nightmare scenario in this case would be that the Supreme Court rules with the Brackeens and ICWA is ruled unconstitutional and it constitutes racial discrimination. And those enrolled in tribal nations are given a racial status instead of political status. If this were to happen, <clears throat> this would put into question many federal laws, uh, federal Indian laws that could be challenged. The Major Crimes Act, which established the role of the federal government in law enforcement on native lands could be overturned. The Environmental Protection Agency policy that allows native nations to ensure that oil and gas companies adhere to environmental regulations could be thrown out. Federal programs that offer assistance or health and welfare care to native nations could also be called into question. The same arguments that are being made against ICWA have also been made against tribal casinos and tribal gaming. 
Tribal reservations only make up 2% of the land population in the United States, but they sit on trillions of dollars worth of natural resources that oil and gas companies can't get to without tribal consent. The attorneys for the Brackeens that are arguing that ICWA is unconstitutional are the same attorneys who have argued on behalf of big oil. Gibson Dunn, the law firm, in this case representing them pro bono, is also the same law firm that represented the Dakota Access Pipeline. The stakes are very high because this could have a ripple effect that threatens everything from gaming to hunting and fishing rights to health, to tribal self-governance, tribal police, and our very existence as tribal nations. So I want to leave you with some resources here um, to learn more about ICWA and what has been done, and even to read some of the briefs that, is, that have been filed on behalf of saving ICWA, you can visit the Lakota Law People's Project, the Association on American Indian Affairs, where you can find that report that they did, excuse me, way back when, the Native American Rights Fund, <clears throat> which has some great ICWA resources, Blood Memory is actually a documentary that you can find on a number of streaming services. I think I'm trying to remember, I think I found it on YouTube, um, but it explores ICWA, um, adoptees, and finding their way home and the trauma that they experienced. And then also, if you like podcasts, I love a good podcast when I have to drive like a long ways, I just throw on a podcast. This Land, particularly season two, discusses ICWA and the importance of saving it. Um, I recommend that you listen to This Land uh, season two. I think it's like, it's not even that many episodes. It might be like seven or eight episodes and they're not super long. They're like half hour to maybe an hour at the most. Um, so that is what I want to leave you with. And with that, I will open it up to any questions that anyone might have. And again, thank you guys for uh, working through my COVID voice um, and not uh, being as loud and boisterous as I usually am. So thank you for bearing with me on that. But yes, any questions that um, anyone might have, I will definitely open up the, the floor to that. And uh, thank you guys so much again for allowing me to um, present on this really, really important topic. So we do have some time for some questions for Heather, and then we have one more person that's just going to give us a little bit more information about ways we can um, learn more and stay involved locally if you have any interest in that. Thank you, Heather. That was wonderful. Is there anybody? Thank you. Is there anybody in the room that has questions? Yeah. You you're welcome to either come stand up here if you'd like to, or I can repeat the question for you by the microphone. Would you repeat the question? Absolutely. So my question is, since this case has already been heard by the Supreme Court, which means that they either have made their decision or are close to making their decision, what then can we actually do to advocate in favor of it? Do you want to say that? So the question, Heather, was, um, because this case is already in front of the Supreme Court, is there anything that if we wanted to advocate for ICWA that can still be done? Or is this kind of a, a something we just wait and see now? No, you can definitely still um, sign on to briefs that different organizations have submitted. You can make your voice heard. You can reach out to your uh, elected representatives and still they um, they can sign on to different briefs that have already been um, sent. And yeah, so there's still a lot that you can do. The other big thing that you can do is you can tell someone about it. 
Um, that's huge. That's just, just being able to have that knowledge and be able to pass it on is really important. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Yes. Thank you, Heather. I was wondering what led to the final closing of the boarding school? I can repeat that just in case anybody didn't hear. Um, the question was, what led to the final closing of the boarding school? Honestly, majority of the time, it was lack of students um, and lack of funding. Funding started to run out. And so also many people were um, not really in need of them anymore as, you know, more movements were rising up and people were... Um, doing, uh, trying to assert their their uh, rights as indigenous people more. Um, schools were really finding that they didn't have um, the ability to stay open and they weren't relevant. Thank you. Yeah. This may be a really silly question, but so the, the young children who went to the boarding schools then didn't really have a place to go after they got done with school. What happened to these children? And what, what did they do as young adults? They really didn't fit with their communities, but they really, I mean, where did they go? I'm just trying to wrap my head around the situation and understand and, and what, what all, all of these kids or young adults went through. Yeah, so just to repeat for anybody at home that didn't hear, the question was in regards to the boarding schools and what happened when children kind of aged out of that program and they didn't fit in their communities anymore, where would they go? Yeah, no, first, that's not a silly question. I did hear you say that at the beginning. That's not a silly question. Um, in terms of like my grandparents, I can tell you for sure, my grandparents and my great-grandparents, they still went back to the reservation. There were so many people that, from the reservation that were at boarding schools that it was kind of like a community and so they still had that that sense of community um other people they would do the best that they could in whatever situation that they found themselves in so um whether that was uh, maybe marrying somebody who was non-native that might help them fit in uh, in the non-native world or just going back to the reservation and maybe trying to find ways to work within their communities. Um, so it was, you know, it was definitely like a tough journey for a lot of people, but more often than not, if you went back to your community and you stayed in your community and you worked hard in your community, you were, um, you were like welcomed back in because it's not that like anyone looked down on you for having to go to these boarding schools, but it was kind of yourself of like, you didn't feel like you fit in because you were gone for so long. Um, but more often than not, you would in some way, shape or form be welcomed back into your community, especially if you went back there and you kind of like put in the work. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Um the U.S. Supreme Court rules basically rules against uh, ICWA, and it seems likely that they will. From what I've been reading, is there anything that Congress can do to codify Native sovereignty, similar to what's being done right now with uh, uh, same-sex marriage? So the question was, if ICWA fails, is there anything else that can um, do the same thing from the federal government, right? To protect, put, put in, in, install the same protections. That's, that's a great question. Um, and not actually one that I actually think I have an answer for because I'm not sure if it would work in the same way because Congress and the federal government have already recognized us as sovereign nations. So then I think it would, I think what we might see maybe is more um, money on the tribal side being invested into social work programs that are strictly um, native for native children. So I think we might see something like that. I'm not sure, I'm not sure even if this Congress would do something, um, not like this one, but like the next one. I'm not sure if they would do something to to codify ICWA um, into, 
to like passing it um, into a law like they just did with the, the various marriage acts that they did, which I am grateful for, but also extremely sad that something like that had to happen. Um, so yeah, so I don't necessarily have a definite um, non-rambling answer for that. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I think you have it. I'm wondering if you have a sense. Um, uh, my my uh, my family's experience with ICWA has been really quite smooth. Um, uh, uh, my wife and I fostered for a number of years, and um, I'm wondering if you have a sense. Uh, well, is that like we had one problem? There was one judge. In, uh, in Milwaukee, who just, I don't know, he wasn't aware of the law. They didn't ask, um, they didn't ask the tribal affiliation of the child. Um, but um, do you have a sense, is this, it, it, are there a lot of places in the country where there's, where there's a lot of, um, uh, where there's, there's a lot of legal challenges? Um, you know, or, or is it in the, for the most part, this it would sort of seem to, um, work as as legislated. I mean, like like I said, that's that's my experience. But you know, I'm here working with the United Tribe, and so that you know. Uh, but I, I don't really have a sense for other places in the country if what is commonly you know fraught. So the question was just if this if it was challenged really frequently, or if it kind of works like it's supposed to work, and the yeah, steps yeah. are fairly easy. Yeah, so like I said in the presentation, ICWA has been challenged more times than the Affordable Care Act. So it has been challenged a number of times. And when it is challenged, it's usually challenged in states where there's a large indigenous population. Um, so it's usually out west. Um, I've seen a lot of cases pop up in like New Mexico and Arizona um, and Texas even before this case. So, but in the rest of the country where ICWA um, is also, because you know, it's law of the land, it runs very smoothly. And it always seems to be challenged um, when a non-Native couple gets it in their head that they've somehow been wrong. Um, I've seen it happen where, I mean, there's been a number of Supreme Court cases that have already happened um, where um, ICWA has been, you know, challenged and it's, it's, you know, not necessarily it's ICWA itself, but it's usually the adoption case that goes before the court. And the way we also see it played out in the media is that the family, the non-Native family has somehow been wronged, right? They've been harmed instead of really looking at um, what, what the tribal nation and what Indigenous people have to go through. Um, so it's, and it's, it's, it's kind of the same way with like MMIW cases. There's this tone of victim blaming and there is, um, I'm trying to think, my words are escaping me. I, I think I have COVID brain, but um, there is also like this sense of entitlement, right? That non, not all non-Native couples, but some Native, non-Native couples seem to have, and they're like, oh, but we've been fostering this child and we should be able to, you know, um, protect it. And, you know, because we don't, we want to get it out of that horrible environment. So <laughs> to answer your question, because I now realize I'm rambling, to answer your question, um, ICWA really does run really smoothly when it's implemented and, and, and followed to the letter that it should be followed. Um, but again, it has still been challenged more times than the Affordable Care Act. And every single challenge has been that the, pro the person who brings the challenge, um, they feel discriminated against in some way, even though it's not really a discriminatory law, if you really stop and think about it. Great. Okay, I have one more question on here. So I'll give you this, and then we're going to turn the mic over to um, another speaker real quick that's going to give us some local information. Mm -hmm. And the question was, have the nations made any progress in recovering from having so many of their children taken? So a lot of times, um, you know, children who have been adopted out, who have found out that they've been adopted out and they've made their way back 
to their tribal nations have been welcomed with open arms because it's through no fault of their own that they were forced to leave um, and have been welcomed in and got, um, you know, they bring them back into the community and try to help them reclaim some of that uh, history and culture that they've lost. So yes, the tribal nations have been very welcoming. Thank you. So um, Heather, you're welcome to stay with us if you'd like, or if you need to go, I understand that as well. I'm going to welcome in another speaker real quick. Dr. Renee Grelwitz is here. Um, and Renee is going to give us a little bit more information about ways we can learn more and uh, ways that we can get involved in something if we'd like to. Great. Thank you so much. Heather, your presentation was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, um, and I say it's amazing because my heart hurts and I'm really deeply wounded. And if you're not angry, I think you need to watch this presentation again because this has been intentional genocide. General George Washington, when he became the president of the United States, he clearly said that the way that we're going to get this land is to educate the children. And he had set that in motion all the way to the, in, the Civilization Act. It was intentional genocide. If I can remove you from your culture so that you fear going back home, so that when you go home, everybody there is a stranger, you don't wanna go home, you're not going to claim your heritage. You're not going to know who you are. And therefore, it's, it's, it's not by accident that we are less than 2% of the US population. This has been intentional genocide from boarding schools where our children were taught how to parent by using the backside of their hand or by a belt. We learn how to parent from the adults around us. And when you're in boarding school, when you're not in line quick enough or your dishes weren't clean enough or the lines that you were sewing weren't good enough, you are punished and punished severely. So when these people become adults and they have children of their own, that is the parenting style they learn. And so we have a lot of internal generational trauma, not just because of what was inflicted upon us, but what our grandparents and great grandparents had done to their children, because that's the way they were taught and trained. In Wisconsin, we're lucky we have the Wisconsin Indian Child Welfare Act passed in 2009. So at least the, the nations in Wisconsin will be slightly protected should the Supreme Court make this terrible decision in the favor of the Brackeens. Our Chief Justice Kavanaugh has already stated a number of times that the tribe's issues and the tribe's needs are subservient to that of the state. Kavanaugh has also already said that there's a difference between what happens on Indian land in the reservation and what happens in non-reservation land, that those children should be treated differently. We already know that over 80% of the native people do not live on reservation land. So somehow or another that our children who live here in Appleton or Green Bay are not protected under ICWA just because of geography. I wanted to ask Justice Kavanaugh, does this mean so a United States citizen who lives in, in France loses the protections of the US Constitution? So it really is very important. Yes, contact your elected officials. Yes, contact your state elected officials and ask them to stand up, publicly acknowledge Wisconsin Indian Child Welfare Act of 2009 and say they support it because we need to protect our future. Our children are our future. I don't care what nationality you are. Our children are our future. And we teach and we train our children in the future we want them to have and native people should not be held to a different standard. We want to teach and train our children so that they learn to love and respect and know their history and so that they can help our nations move forward. This is a political entity. We are sovereign nations. We are not a race. We are not a minority. And so 
our government has over 500 treaties that acknowledge these sovereign nations. The United States Constitution lists us three times in the US Constitution. So I hope that you will continue to acknowledge the sovereignty of Native nations, acknowledge some of the issues that we are fighting, and stand with us and advocate with us and contact your legislators. I want to thank the university, the library for hosting this and helping us spread the word. Talk with me.